Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. After deflasking the polymerized maxillary immediate denture, it is reattached to its previous articulator mounting. Any discrepancies in the contact vertical dimension and centric occlusion are removed by selective grinding. The recovered master cast and processed denture are reunited to the articulator mounting with impression plaster. The amount of processing error is demonstrated by observing the relationship of the incisal pin to the upper member of the articulator and to the incisal table. This one millimeter space, therefore, represents the amount of vertical dimension to be closed. Prior to the securing of maxillary mandibular jaw relationship records, the cusp heights of the mandibular natural teeth are reduced. This provides a more even plane of occlusion and hopefully increases the stability of the maxillary immediate denture by decreasing the potential to develop lateral forces. The first step in selective grinding is to re-establish the contact vertical dimension and centric occlusion. Articulating ribbon is placed over the lower stone teeth and the denture gently tapped until markings of prematurities are transferred to the maxillary denture. The buccal cusp of the mandibular tooth occludes in the central fossa of the maxillary denture tooth and is the main supporting cusp. Therefore, reduction of prematurities will be performed on the maxillary denture teeth. The red areas are carefully ground with a white gemstone. As they are removed, more and more posterior teeth will come into contact. Once more, the articulator is moved up and down on the interposed ribbon. Red spots representing the prematurities will again be reduced with a stone. As this procedure is continued, a uniform contact is attained throughout the posterior teeth of the denture and the contact vertical dimension of occlusion is re-established. The elimination of the processing error in centric occlusion and the closure of the vertical dimension can be seen by the relationship of the incisal pin to the upper member of the articulator and its intimate contact with the incisal table. The one millimeter space no longer exists. The uniform contact of the teeth can be seen in this lateral view. Working and balancing contacts will now be evaluated. The condylar mechanism of the articulator is loosened to allow free lateral movement. The articulating ribbon is again interposed between the denture and the mandibular stone teeth and a lateral movement is simulated. Premature contacts are thus transferred to the posterior denture teeth. The balancing contact markings are located on the lingual cusp of the right maxillary posterior molars. Working prematurities are located on the left cuspid and the buccal cusp of the left maxillary second molars. The white gemstone is again used to remove the prematurities.
The reduction is carefully performed so as not to remove too much tooth structure at one time. It is far better to repeat the process until the desired contact is achieved. This alternate marking and selective grinding is continued for both right and left lateral movements. The ultimate objective is to have as many posterior bilateral contacts as possible and reduce the lateral incisal guidance to a low angle, thereby increasing the stability of the denture. The next step in our selective grinding is a careful evaluation of the protrusive movement. The articulator's condylar mechanism, having previously been loosened, allows the protrusive movement to be made. Our objective at this stage is to achieve a simultaneous contact of as many posterior teeth as possible and light anterior tooth contacts. Heavy anterior contacts, as seen here, must be eliminated. Once the markings have been made on the maxillary denture, the heavy posterior contacts are carefully removed with the gemstone. The heavy anterior contacts are also eliminated. Note how lightly the stone is used to remove the most prominent markings. The protrusive movement is repeated on the interposed articulating ribbon. It is evident that the few minor adjustments to the protrusive movement have created multiple posterior bilateral contacts with a minimum of contact in the anterior portion of the denture. This selective grinding has also established a smooth, gliding, and free articulation of the teeth. The denture can now be removed from the articulator, recovered from the master cast, and the peripheries adjusted. An arbor band mounted on the dental lathe is used to carefully round the peripheries of the denture. Since the proper length of the buccal and labial flanges was previously recorded during the impression period, the trimming with the arbor band should be merely one of rounding, but not shortening. The posterior palatal seal area is also carefully trimmed back to the proper extent as determined by the final maxillary impression. Having completed this peripheral adjustment, we should now turn our attention to the tissue surface of the denture. Projections of acrylic, which are the result of incomplete healing in the maxillary posterior region, should be removed from the inside of the denture to prevent irritation and to allow the proper sequence of healing. Multiple irregularities usually result in the anterior region following the removal of the anterior teeth from the stone model and setting up the denture teeth. These anterior and posterior projections of acrylic can be removed from the denture with a vulcanite burr. Only those undercuts which prevent the denture from being seated should be removed. In general, these are located in the cuspid and posterior tuberosity regions. A flame-shaped vulcanite burr used in a straight handpiece is excellent for this purpose.
The labial notch should be enlarged to the dimension of the frenum as recorded in the impression. This can be accomplished with a number 703 dentate revelation burr. Grinding should be in a straight and vertical direction as opposed to a V-shaped opening. Overzealous reduction can result in the loss of retention. The borders are then polished with a mixture of water and pumice. It should be emphasized that the periphery is rounded and not reduced to a thin knife-like edge. Excessive use of pumice should be avoided and great care should be taken so as not to destroy the anatomic form of our restoration. A stippling effect can be created on the labial and buccal flanges of the denture with a number eight round burr, which has been defluted by removing half of its cutting blade. The final polishing of the denture is achieved with a rag wheel and a Bendix dental polish. After the denture has been scrubbed with lukewarm water and detergent, it is carefully evaluated. If the tissue surface of the denture is smooth and free of projections, there is less likelihood of the patient experiencing post-delivery problems. Soreness and irritation and subsequent denture adjustments should be minimal. The stippling effect reduces the harsh reflection of light and provides a more natural appearance. The insertion of the denture will not be shown in this film. Subsequent examination of the maxillary ridge reveals no evidence of irritation. This further emphasizes the importance of a careful pre-delivery preparation of the denture. The occlusion and aesthetics are quite satisfactory. The patient may now be dismissed. However, the need to rebase or reline this denture in the very near future should be emphasized and a recall appointment made mandatory. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.